I do this one without notes. Um, we want to go over a few things. This is my last lecture. Uh, Cleve will be given it Wednesday, so I want to review a few things. Here's the review of the reading assignment. Now, we've had chapter six, which is the physiology chapter. But remember, uh, Dr. Cleaver gave you a handout. So that handout is more important than the chapter six, but you might want to look over both of them. And then chapter seven, uh, chapter 11, uh, is you should just look it over. What is chapter 11? That's the uh, vineyard supports or trellises. And uh, Dr. Cleaver, of course, gave you a lecture on that in the in the lab and in the field, but you might want to glance through that chapter at least. Then chapter 14, which is uh, means of improving grape quality. I think you better read that rather carefully because uh, the lecture, not that Cleaver gave it, but when I gave it, it's sort of confusing when you go over it once lightly, so you might want to go back over that. Uh, chapter 15 is cultivation of weed control, so you have that one. Chapter 16 is irrigation. And then in part, you'll want to cover uh, the parts that I told you about in chapter 18 on great diseases. And the same in chapter 19. Now, chapter 19 is great pests. And this is going to be the uh, subject that Dr. Cleaver will cover in the next lecture. And he will tell you then the more important ones in there you need to know. Obviously, in this course, you won't be covering raising insects and uh, things of that type. But um, you should get that handout that's on reserve, or they should come in this morning. They promised me that I went ahead and ordered 30 sets for those of you who had given your money, and uh, they should be in this morning. But uh, just to be safe, it might be better to wait till tomorrow morning, because apparently the mail has come in, so it won't be in until this afternoon at the earliest. And. Uh, those, that then, that, uh, the part that Dr. Cleaver will tell you next time on chapter 19, plus a particular set of instructions which are on reserve. Remember, you don't have to buy those. There's seven on reserve in the main library and three on reserve here in our VIT library. Uh, on that little handout test that we had before, this evolution of a vineyard, there's still a number of you who haven't picked them up if you want them. Bear, uh, Depew, uh, Nico. Catlin, Mondavi, Brander, Lasker, Clark Peters, Bob Rue, and Tom Sentence papers are up here if you want to pick them up. Well, uh, last time, remember, I told you we were trying to follow somewhat of a pattern. We hit the root uh, pest, and then we went into uh, fungi of the roots, which was the oak root fungus, and then we went to uh, fungi of the uh, top part, we hit dead arm. Then we hit this um, black measles, which is sort of an enigma. We don't know quite what it is, but it seems to be a sort of a byproduct of a fungus. And today we want to hit the last and two most common fungus problems of the grapevine over the world, one place or another. And the first one, of course, is you've heard so much about is powdery mildew. And you have to know the name of this. It's Uncinelia. Uncinelia. Nicator. And later on, we'll talk about the other one, which is downy mildew. And you have to know the name of it, and it's Pasmopra. Viticola, and this one is often called, a uh, uh, common name in Europe is to call it Peronospora. This is the common name in Europe, and the, co and the common name for, now let's go back to powdery mildew, the common name for it in Europe is Oidium. So if you ever go to Europe and hear the term Oidium, don't ask them what it is. Now, we don't, I'll just say right off the bat that we don't have a problem with downy mildew in California. So we'll end up on that so, so that you know what it's all about. But we do have this one big problem 
of powdery mildew in the state. And why is it such a big problem here? Um, uh, powdery mildew is one of the rather unusual fungi that thrives on low humidity. It does not have to have high humidity in order to uh, function well, such as the dead arm as we talked about last time. So under our California conditions of low humidity, it does quite well. Yeah. It can, for example, uh, it can, uh, infections can occur as low as at 45 degrees Fahrenheit and up to about 95. You can get germination of the spores during, in this range from 45 to 95 and in relative humidities which approach zero. And of course, on up to 40 or 50 or so, it does best or does just as well as, say, at relatively low humidities. So why is it then that people talk about uh, the dangers of increased powdery mildew after irrigations? Because supposedly that would just raise the humidity under the vines. But in California, with our low humidity and with the wet soil, you get evaporation, you get cooling. And the, and the fungi does, this fungus, uh, uh, powdery mildew fungus does best at a range of about 75 to 80 degrees. So you get a little bit of cooling and you get a greater infection from it. Not particularly because of the increased humidity, but because of the cooler conditions. So that when you have light rains and cloudy overcast weather and so on, you're getting it not because of the higher humidity, but because of the cooler temperatures. As I say, it can grow it and it can, the spores can germinate between 45 and 95 Fahrenheit but if you get a few hours up over 100, uh, four hours or so at about 104 degrees will kill it. So when you get in the late summers in the Fresno area and so on, uh, and get three or four hours in the afternoon above over 102, 104 degrees, you pretty well inactivate uh, the powdery mildew. But getting back then to how this mildew works, uh, it attacks all green surface including stems, clusters, and I guess even unopened flowers in some situations, and, and puts down this powdery mildew film. So once again, let's look at uh, what, it, what it looks like and then talk about how we're going to take care of it. trying to get that straight now we'll talk about how the mildew spreads of course as often fungi do by spores and it germinates and puts down uh, what we call hostoria which I commonly refer to as just feet hostoria and these are sort of roots if you want to call it that penetrate into the leaf cells and then this hostoria then uh, feed the mycelium which is really what you look at when you see mostly the powdery mildew. And then the mycelium, of course, produces the spores. Now here, it begins first on the, un on the underside of a leaf and begins just, as you might think, with a little touches of what look like powder. You see it here just beginning. I want to catch some. Here's about the best little spot you can see. And you never want to let it get that far even. The, the uh, control of mildew, I'll tell you in a moment, is prevention. And, and it's simple. We have one material to control it, and it's sulfur dust, or sulfur, very finely divided sulfur. And you must get all the green parts of the plant, keep all green parts of the plant completely covered with it, but the secret is that you must do it before you ever see any mildew. If you wait till you see the mildew, you're already too late, because once this mycelium is formed that with a whole story of penetrating the cells, then this mycelium is resistant to the sulfur. The spores are not, as they germinate, before they can germinate and grow far enough so that they can put out hostoria and get established, then they're extremely susceptible to sulfur. Any sulfur particle they contact kills them. But once the mycelium is established as a sort of a full-grown plant, then the sulfur dust doesn't do any good at all. 
Now, this is one of the main reasons when I've talked to some of you about backyard vines. It's better not to fool around with planting vines in your backyard because it's hard enough to get the average city dweller to take care of insects or bugs when they're pack, they picking the plant up and walking off with it. And to tell him that he has to go out there and dust and spray before, while the vine looks perfectly healthy will never penetrate. <laughs> never penetrate it. <laughs> so he lets the vines get mildew all over him, then comes screaming for help. And it's too late in most cases. But anyway, this is where it starts. Okay, next slide. And here it is uh, in, in more advanced stages on the berries. These are Thompson seedless berries. I'll talk in a moment about variety susceptibility. Thompson is one of the more susceptible ones. And you can see the, why they call it powdery mildew here in various stages beginning on these berries. That's a pretty bad situation now to try to fight. Next slide. And here it is on Tokay. And uh, uh, you can see uh, what's the insect this looks like. Uh, the one, one of yours in that series. Um, no. <laughs> You'll recognize the next, next lecture. Anyway, I, and we're going on mine right now. Uh, mealy bug, the mealy bug. Now, I don't get a picture of mi mildew mixed up with great mealy bug because just a very quick glance, it, if, there, if there were bugs sitting there, you'd say that's great mealy bug, but uh, this is mildew. No bugs involved in it at all on a tokay berry, this flat bottom gives you a way of being tokay. Next slide. And here's a cluster of Thompson's. Uh, doesn't show it quite so well, but this cluster in here and back in here is pretty well fouled up with mildew. And then when the mildew gets real bad, it can cause the berries to crack and split, and then you get leakage, and then you get secondary uh, fungus problems, rots, and so forth moving in. And in a backyard or even in a vineyard, once it gets this bad, you can smell it pretty badly. And in a backyard arbor, that isn't exactly what you planned the arbor for. Next slide. Now, I said you control it with sulfur dust, but uh, a lot of these old-time growers in the coastal counties and so forth have the idea, you hear, you hear them talk about putting on sulfur and it's fuming, and it's the fumes that kill a mildew. So they just don't worry about spreading it evenly, they just go out and glop it on. And they think that, well, the fumes will spread from here down to here and so forth and take care of it, which is a complete fallacy and completely an error because what you've got to do is, is place little tiny sulfur particles a hundredth of a millimeter apart all over the whole plant so that when one of these spores starts to grow, then uh, it runs into that particle and is dead before it knows, before it can uh, get any farther. This is pretty bad. Uh, if it didn't do anything else, it cuts down on photosynthesis. It, it wastes sulfur. But in these close planted seven foot vineyards in the coastal counties and in, in parts of uh, the rest of the world where we have such close plantings, they have to use backpack sprayers or backpack dusters, and sometimes they don't work very well and they glop it on. So you waste it and cut down photosynthesis and, and don't cover the plant evenly anyway. But I thought that was a classic picture when we took it. And I'll tell that. Okay, that's all for that. Now, the question was raised on this matter of sulfur dusting about burn. Remember that sulfur will control mildew, but if you, if you dust and the temperature goes up to 100, 102, and a day or two after you dust, you're liable to get some injury. You get a little burning of the young foliage, perhaps around the edges. So, but uh, I think sometimes this comment about the burn from sulfur is a little overdone because if you counted up the leaf surface that is burnt by sulfur, it might amount to 1% at the most of the foliage. And it's much better to burn 1% of the foliage than it is to uh, put it off and not, and not dust at all. But I have seen an appreciable burn enough to cause a grower to wonder if he hadn't hurt his vines. But uh, I think that it's better to, you can't, sometimes you can't predict the warm weather. That warm spell we had over the holiday weekend, uh, some of the people in the department said that they dusted the day before. You know, it got up to 100, 102 in the coastal area that weekend. But it was better for them to have dusted than to have uh, uh, delayed because they thought it might get hot. But you can get some burn. And talking about burn then and susceptibility, um, the, the Concord types, 
the Concord or Eastern varieties, are much more sensitive to sulfur burn. And under a high uh, temperature conditions here, if you dusted uh, your, any Concord or Eastern type uh, grape with sulfur dust and it got up around 100, you might get some pretty serious burn. Fortunately, these Eastern varieties where uh, mildew is endemic also are pretty tolerant to powdery mildew so that uh, they don't require much dusting. Once again, the reason why I say if people want a backyard arbor, plant some sort of uh, Eastern rootstock if they don't like the fruit or, or concord or something of that type that uh, doesn't require, under normal conditions, doesn't require much sulfur dusting, if any. Okay, talking about variety resistance, uh, you have some notes, comments in the chapter that you were assigned, to, or the area that, the chapter or paragraph you were assigned to read on this about variety resistance. Uh, one time I made quite a campaign to try to find out from everybody I could talk to what would be uh, most resistant, least resistant, and so on. But the fact is that all vinifera varieties are uh, susceptible, but there is a little bit of a range. Among the more resistant ones are Semillon and Petit Syrah and Cabernet, fortunately, Cabernet. So uh, I won't bother to write these on, but uh, Semillon, Petit Syrah, and Cabernet are quite resistant. Maybe I ought to, need to put them on after all. So we have Semillon, Petit Syrah, and Cabernet are among our more resistant ones. Now, these are just, remember, uh, this is just a very relative uh, thing. Among the more uh, susceptible ones, going to the other extreme, would be this Tokay and Thompson that you just saw. Tokay, Thompson seedless. Uh, Muscat of Alexandria, and Sylvaner. And the one that I left off, probably the most susceptible of all, Carignan. So Carignan, this is a list then of varieties which are really susceptible to powdery mildew. And then we got a few in between. Uh, Actually, we should, for, for this class, we perhaps ought to add a white Riesling and Chardonnay to this list here, which are quite susceptible. Uh, this is not in order. I'm just listing them as I think of them. This is white Riesling, uh, which is fairly susceptible, and Chardonnay. So all the others you might consider then more or less intermediate. And remember, I'm stressing the point that there's not a great range of difference from top to bottom or from the so-called resistant group to the more susceptible group over here. But we do have a little bit of a spread. All right, and then we might say something about uh, how this fungus overwinters. It overwinters in one of two ways. During the growing season, the mycelium can grow down into those newly formed buds in between the bud scales. Believe it or not, it can get down in between them. And uh, that may sound a little uh, like it might be a little difficult, but just as a little offhand personal remark, I spent a sabbatic leave in the southeast United States, and the fungus down there can grow down between the layers of the lenses on your camera and ruin it. <laughs> unless you keep your camera in a dry spot. So some of these fungus, I guess, can squeeze into pretty small cracks. So anyway, this uh, uh, powdery mildew can grow down into those bud scales between them and then overwinter. And this is the most common way in which it overwinters. And then in the spring, of course, when the bud uh, unfolds and starts to grow, the mycelium is there in cool weather conditions and can take off and give you a, a very heavy uh, infestation in a hurry if you're not right on the ball and take and get out to a dust when the shoots are very short. In some situations where it's really bad like that, it might be better to go ahead and spray. But I'll talk about spraying here in a moment. So uh, it can under it can overwinter like that, or it can overwinter on the old wood, um, in which uh, it's in little uh, spore sacks or spore cases. And these are called Christothecia, but uh, you don't need to know that unless you're a plant pathologist. And these overwintering little structures, they contain uh, about normally eight spores. 
And they're those little fly, little raised fly speck spots that you see out there when you're pruning in the wintertime. They look like uh, leaf hopper droppings, or I, that's what the book says, but I think they look like more like big fly specks uh, on, the, on the cane. And they're just very, very slightly raised. You rub your finger over them and you can just feel them. If you, so they overwinter in those quite a bit on the old wood or on the cane. So, so these are the two main ways in which the mildew overwinters. And I say, uh, the control is prevention, and it's just very easy. You can read all you want to about it, but the easiest way to do it is to spray at 6, 12, and 18 inches of average shoot growth length. When the average shoot length is 6 inches, 12 inches, and 18 inches. And if you've got a bad situation or table fruit, you may even want to do it when it gets out to 24 inches, which really means then about every week to 10 days from the time the shoots come out. And if you've got a bad situation, have had bad damage in the past, you, want, you may want to go out and dust even when the shoots are, the longest ones are six, instead of the average length to be in six inches. And what we do here is just spray every other middle every other week. So it's actually 14 days apart here at Davis. And that works out very nicely in most situations where you spray real fast, make a double turn and go back and so on. So you can skip a middle and then come back the next week on the in-between middles. If you've got good spray, uh, good dusting equipment, this will probably work under normal situations. One of the biggest needs that California industry has is a really good, well-engineered sulfur dusting equipment. Because what most of them do is just poke out a little, uh, blow out a little air with a little sulfur in it on each side and so we just sort of poop it out. Not much better than the hand job you saw. What we need, to ideally, is something that produces a terrific volume of air at low speed and just shoves the air that's around this vine out of the way and replaces it with a sulfur-laden air. Sort of a big volume, but low uh, speed or low pressure duster that will mix up a good load of sulfur and put it out. But so far, we don't really have a perfect sulfur duster. By the time somebody gets around to developing one, the uh, pollution and conservationist people and so forth will say we can't use dust anyway, so I don't know whether it's worth developing or not. Uh, when I say that, we used to include, for example, when we use sulfur dust, we used to include DDT or malathion dust or some, some of these other materials at the same time because very few growers until recent years have owned a sprayer because the one big problem has been mildew and they could put in uh, dry mixes with it of all these insecticides and so forth and take care of leafhopper and red spider and what have you. So we're going to have to go through some changes in the industry in the next few years as we go over to spray equipment. But speaking, speaking of spray equipment, when this mildew gets established and you get the mycelium and you get that, uh, that uh, webbing that you see on the leaves and on the fruit, then you're too late to use sulfur dust, as I say, and the only thing you can do then is go in and use water and spray with the hope that you can uh, destroy both the mycelium and the spores by water absorption. The spores and the mycelium both will absorb water to the breaking point to burst the spores and to actually destroy the mycelium. The thing that I objected to and have always objected to and Dr. Hewitt's recommendations and so forth this type of thing and we've tried to emphasize it in the new book is all the instructions make it sound like well you can you can dust and if it does not and if you forget to dust well you can always go out and spray but in order to kill this mildew you have got to practically pull the vine up and stick its head down in the barrel and churn it up and down in the water you've got to do a good absolute thorough job of wetting an absolute thorough job which means that you use uh, uh, lots of water, two or 300 gallons per acre, with a wetting agent to spread the water thoroughly. And then you've just got to have excellent spray equipment, either maybe hand guns and walking behind the uh, sprayer to spray underneath and so forth to do a very, very thorough job of wetting. Otherwise, you still can't lick it. And with that water, so you put water and wetting agent and one or two pounds of wettable sulfur wettable sulfur in the water because once you wash off everything then you must once again cover the foliage with sulfur so if you put in the wettable sulfur with the water 
if you do a good job, then you've uh, uh, done a good job of eliminating the mycelium and the spores and recovered all the green foliage with another coating of sulfur dust. Now, once again, speaking of wetting, so this is 612, 18 inches, but if you sprayed, if you dust, or dusted this morning the 12 inch shoot growth, and then we got a, a half an inch or a quarter of an inch of rain tonight, then you've got to get out there and wet and cover it again. You have to keep the green, all green foliage covered with sulfur dust or sulfur particles, excuse me, sulfur particles, you can put it on as, as a spray. And that's just about the story of uh, powdery mildew. It's, uh, it's uh, over most of the state, a few of these new areas are planted, or a few of the places up around Clear Lake and so forth don't seem to have much of a problem. For some reason, it doesn't seem to have gotten established. It's worse in some areas than others. Uh, it's a, uh, once it gets established, you've got to really work at it. One other point I might make is that I'm talking about 6, 12, 18 inches, usually in wine grapes, usually up to here about uh, midsummer is enough because for two things, two things help you toward the end of the summer on the decrease of the powdery mildew activity. First is the high temperatures, and secondly, once the berries get up to about 12, 12 or 14 percent sugar, they're not affected anymore by powdery mildew. I don't know why, but the powdery mildew won't bother the berries as they get up around 12, 14 sugar. So that plus the heat seems to uh, wipe out the necessity for it on most of the wine grapes after midsummer, but sometimes for table fruits, you might want to put on just one more application just to be sure. Um, what else? And I think that covers just about what you need to know about it. Uh, some people ask a few questions about uh, uh, what about winter spraying to catch those buds. What about doing a good soaking winter spray to see if you can get it into the uh, kill the mycelium in those bu buds? But the the trials that have been carried out show that that doesn't work at all. Yes. Uh, do you have any idea whether or not benzoate is a good substitute for sulfur? Uh, I can't find out. I want to see Dr. Wing to see if any of these other materials would work. But you brought up one point that I I don't think it will for powdery mildew because one of the errors that's in your textbook and you want to make a note of it, and I fought this one out for a long time. Um, on page 380, in the last paragraph of 380, uh, yeah, in the last paragraph 380 is a real striking error. It says, in humid areas with frequent summer rains, control of downy mildew is likely to be necessary. We're going to discuss it next. And it should largely control powdery mildew also. Well, the, st the sentence itself is rather poorly written, but uh, because uh, that doesn't make the control, should control powdery mildew also. And then he says, when powdery mildew is the only disease, under most conditions, control will be adequate if one uses a copper-containing fungicide, such as Bordeaux mix. And that whole paragraph is fouled up because he's mis misworded here and so on. So just that last paragraph on just above anthracnose on page 380, you just strike out. Because copper will not affect powdery mildew. And this is one of the problems. See, uh, we use uh, copper sulfate or, or Bordeaux mix to control uh, downy mildew. But uh, this, this implies that if you're controlling downy mildew with Bordeaux spray, you can also take care of the powdery mildew at the same time. And you cannot. You either have to include wettable sulfur with the Bordeaux mix, or else you've got to go through, and as they do in Europe, they do one of two things, either spray separately or put the wettable sulfur in with the Bordeaux mix to control the powdery mildew, which is also present. So since copper won't take care of it, uh, I'm pretty sure Benlate will not either, but I'll, I'll check on that and with Dr. Winkler. Uh, I tried to catch him this morning to see the latest edition, see how he had corrected this paragraph that I griped about so much, but I didn't get a chance to see him. Um, Okay, so at the moment then it looked like uh, sulfur, wettable, or, or as a dust are the two things that are most important, or the, the way to control it. And we don't know how the sulfur works. Before somebody holds up his hand, I tried to find out from Hewitt and got a long bunch of uh, beating around the bush, but he doesn't know either why, how it works. So uh, uh, we just know that it does, and we better be glad that it does control 
the disease so cheaply and so easily. Okay, the next one then that we want to discuss is this uh, downy mildew, and just hit it briefly. You see, downy mildew then is Plasmopra viticola. I just want to raise this a moment so you can get there. Plasmopra viticola, and it's called downy mildew. And we fortunately don't have, I don't, I don't think there's any of it has been found in California because it's a high humidity fungus. And we don't have high humidities here. And isn't it, a, and it's amazing that the few inches of rain that they get in Mexico, six or eight inches or 10 inches in the summer, can, be, can cause them two such disastrous additional problems we don't have here. One is the, the providing us uh, phylloxera wing stage and gall stage to that uh, month or two of high humidity in the summer, and also providing a real problem with uh, down and mildew. That's a big problem in Mexico vineyards, even though they only have about a month or so of, of humid weather. So they have both powdery mildew in the dry season and down and mildew during the month or two of wet season. The Europeans have them both all together, both at the same time. The, in Mexico, it's split, so that they have to take care of both of them anyway. So let's see what a downy mildew looks like. I just have a couple of slides, but to give you some idea of what it's all about. This is, I've got a better close-up than this, but this is just a, a, group, a number of leaves off of a nursery, and you can see these these patches, this is on the lower surface of the leaf, but it, sh it shows all the way through. And these later on, they turn like this, make these patches of, of uh, downy uh, uh, mycelium. And then eventually, uh, later on, those patches dry up and fall out. And you have a ragged, burnt looking leaf as a result. The next sl slide's a little bit better in a close up. Again, this is a nursery, and you can see these puckering areas. You might think that that's ear nose mite or something working from the bottom, but uh, it is down in mildew, and this is the one that requires the copper fungicides in order to, or benlate, or some of the, uh, uh, there's a number of these organic materials, uh, zinc containing and copper containing organics, which have been coming on the market recently to uh, help control it. But in the, old, in the past, it's been this Bordeaux mix of 24100 or 44100 applied umpteen times in the European vineyards. Um, that's why the, the European vineyards look blue as you drive through them because they often have to be sprayed anywhere from 8 to 10 or 12 times with, with Bordeaux spray in order to control downy mildew. It will affect and cause uh, uh, break, uh, cracking and shriveling up of the clusters and ruining of the fruit just the way powdery mildew does also. So, as I say, when we here uh, feel sorry for ourselves at having to put on a couple or two or three sprays for one thing or another, just think about the Europeans putting on anywhere, I'd say, from eight to 12 or more sprays per year and doing most of it with backpack. Uh, as I've told some of the people, you, if you look at some of these Geige calendars, showing these nice Swiss hillside vineyards and German vineyards, and every so often you see a little shelter about twice the size of those two tables, and you think, boy, this is something using this expensive land to give them a place for shelter for rain, get out of the rain. But if you look at them carefully, they're all tilted like this, and they're all set up to, be, to uh, act as uh, wa uh, watersheds to collect water in a little cistern. And then they keep their spray materials and their backpack sprayer and so forth under the shed. And these are shaped to flow back into two or three barrels to collect water so they don't have to uh, hoof it down to the river to get water to, to use those sprayers. So it isn't so much a comfort thing as it a necessity in those vineyards. Okay, any question on that? That was fairly fast on down in mildew. Main thing is you got to know the names. <laughs> Fair mouthful, downy, plasma for viticola. Know that we don't have it here. Know that it's a humid, cool, humid uh, type of fungus, whereas powdery mildew can wor work in, uh, likes cool weather. But can germinate, but uh, uh, and likes dry weather, and can can germinate and be a real problem at very low relative humidities. Okay, uh, 
there's no question, uh, since I've got a moment's time here, we will be putting out the old finals uh, sometime, uh, uh, if not by Friday. When's the exam? Tuesday. Next Tuesday? So we better get the old exams out by Wednesday afternoon or Thursday morning at the latest. We'll do what we did before. If I can find the originals, I'll run you off sets so that each one of you can have a set. But if all we can find are those old mimeographs, there's no point in you trying to copy those mimeographs. They won't Xerox. So if that's the case, then I'll just have to put as many as I can on reserve. But if I can get old ones, I will fix them up. Tell them what you're going to do with them if you do find them, if you do find the mimeograph. That's why I said we'll, if, if we can find the mimeograph, we'll run them off. And, and uh, I don't know whether it's better. Your point is whether they take them to the main library here. I guess all of you wandered down the hall. Sometime oh, we could put them right there in front of the grad student's mailbox if, uh, if we can get stacks of them. If not, I guess the thing to do is put a note there saying that we don't have them and that you have to go with the main library to see them. Uh, okay, you got a good point there. We're not promising that you're going to have the same kind of midterm, remember? It just gives you an example of what we've asked in the past. And I think you can be pretty sure this time you're going to get a number of slides. <laughs> and on the, on, you've co we've, covered, uh, we've covered virus diseases. We've covered phylloxera and nematodes. We've covered uh, several fungus problems. And uh, uh, Dr. Tree will be covering insects and so on. And if you have some of these slides, you'll get one or two slides. And you'll be asked to identify it and tell what to do about it. And when you take the exam, of course, what we'll do is identify it first and worry later on about what to do about it. OK. And, uh, Well, it'll be just what it was, like uh, the final was before. I uh, hope to cover general principles from the first midterm and rather detail since the last one. And hopefully we'll try to make some fill-ins and so forth. And just to keep you honest, we may still give you a true, few true and false. Who knows? <laughs> Bring what? <laughs> no. <laughs> Unfortunately, it won't be a keg. OK. This is the first time you ever got out early, but uh, that was all I really had to cover today. Bring blue books and bring all that standard size, remember?